but we want to give each we want to give each of the participants a chance to to really you know do their two minute blurb or maybe three minute blurb but not longer so palash and emmanuel please do now go for it your turn thank you shailaja um hi everyone my name is palash kamizaman as shailaja was trying to pronounce it accurately um, I come from Bangladesh originally. Um, I am a senior lecturer at the University of South Wales. I teach social policy, international development, and uh, my area of interest is like in you know, a participatory development, civil society, extreme poverty, and recently is the aid ethnography and development expertise. So the distinct distinction between the aid expertise is a key interest of mine at this moment. I was funded by the British Academy to do a research on displacement in Bangladesh and Afghanistan. So also moving towards like you know, humanitarianism and development. Next that I hope you know, I'll, be, I'll be making some good use of your presentation. And um, I am here co-presenting co with my wonderful colleague, Emmanuel Kumi, who will introduce um, he himself now. Emmanuel, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Emmanuel, and then I'm based at the University of Ghana. And um, I did my doctorate at the University of Bath in the UK. And in terms of my research works, um, it looks at um, more to do with issues of aid and um, the involvement of um, civil society organizations. And then also um, more recently, my work um, looks at um, the relationship between um, local aid staff and their international counterparts. And is in view of that, why I work with um, him on this work. Thank you very much. Um. I suppose, Shalaja, if I'll just step in, uh, would would either um, Plash or, or Kumi or Emmanuel like to present a bit on your paper yeah, or we, should sorry, we... Sorry, my, my internet just cut out for a second. I do apologise, yes. Um, so, so Shalaja, would you prefer if we move on to the next or ask... Um, uh, are Plash and Kumi, ha Emmanuel, happy with the, the summary of their thing? Can we just move to the next person? Is that is that okay? Brilliant. Okay. okay. In that case... Uh, can we invite uh, Andrea, please, Andrea. Fantastic, all the papers have been so exciting. Please, Andrea, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so in, in the paper, I make the case for embedding intersectionality into participatory methods uh, to address climate change and out outline a methodology based on storytelling, arts and performative approaches. And there is a recognition now of how people's identities across different axes of uh, identity uh, determines how they are affected by climate change. However, when we look at policy and intervention to deal with climate change, we see that sometimes they increase uh, inequalities and injustice, and that this is largely because they are blind to intersectional inequalities, but also because marginalized individuals and groups are excluded from climate knowledge production. And therefore, what I suggest is that to counter this techno-scientific system that is dominating climate change knowledge and policy, I think that an intersectional co-produced knowledge can reveal how these intersectional inequalities interact with climate change and the policy to address it. And, in some, and somehow this intersectional co-produced knowledge can help transform in power relations that are at the core of social identities, potentially eventually leading to more just democratic, multifaceted and multiscalar climate solution. And moreover, these methods can really help 
reimagine the social norms and also the principle that should underpin a just climate transition because they challenge the anthropocentric lens uh, and consider, for example, the interest of uh, non-human animals, the planet and future generation. And I think that the potential of such methodology is to provide fresh insights into complex issues that are grounded in people's experience. And this can challenge what are established assumptions, but also demonstrates a new connection uh, between the issues. And um, that's it for the moment. Thank you, Andrea. Really powerful. And I think uh, we could learn a lot uh, in our discussions in the previous session in terms of thinking about how to bring uh, gender in using intersectionality in the way that you, you've provided very powerfully. So thank you so much for that. And I can already see Polash has put some questions in the chat for you. So uh, I'll leave you to read that, Andrea, while I invite Nick to do the next presentation. Thank you very much. Hi again, everyone. So happy to be uh, taking part in this wonderful panel. So Nejat uh, Sevimdim, I am an independent researcher based in Turkey. Uh, previously, I taught at Bilkent University in Ankara, Turkey, and Bil University in Istanbul, Turkey, mainly in the areas of um, cultural and communication studies. Uh, currently, I'm working as a development slash humanitarian uh, practitioner. In the very preliminary outline of my research that I've submitted, which you may not have had the chance to review yet because I submitted it just yesterday, my apologies for that delay, I'm attempting to raise the question of whether understanding the coming to prominence of the concept of resilience within development uh, can be investigated through a cultural political economy perspective. To me, this involves changing the focus of current research on resilience, which is of course growing exponentially, from the lens of resilience in practice to resilience as the humanitarian development nexus in practice. So consequently, I wish to ask, why did resilience become a popular development term and perhaps even a new regulating ideal of international cooperation and multilateral governance at the specific time at which it did? Was the resilience turn, as it were, enabled by the randomista and the behavioralist revolutions in development, or, uh, development economics in the early 2010s? Uh, which were themselves instrumental, I think, in the move from so-called big development to small development. Secondly, uh, what is the relation of the resilience turn to new modes of crisis construal that emerged in the post-2008 period and with austerity thinking? Uh, can we, thirdly, by tracing the rise to prominence of resilience thinking within the UN Syria crisis response framework from 2014, situate the concept's utility in a context of declining funding for international humanitarian assistance and protracted conflict, resilience to the rescue, as it were. Uh, finally, is development as a pillar of support for transformational progressive thinking salvageable from the resilience turn? In other words, what space is there here for those who may still see development as a cause uh, rather than as a protracted solution, uh, so to speak? Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Negdet? No, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. Say it <laughs> again. Nechdet. Nechdet. C-H. Okay, it's a Nechdet. Okay, that makes it easy. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Really powerful. I mean, doesn't matter. It came late. It was brilliant. I mean, we just read it yesterday and we all just thought this is perfect for the panel. So thank you so much. And I, I immediately thought of stuff between panel session one uh, with paper by Reka and, and Albert and what you were saying and the resonance is very strong. But I'm just going to go in, in order of the questions that are already set in because there are questions that have already been set in. Um, Albert, would you like to read questions out and then address them to people, please? Uh, yeah, sure. And and for anyone who's um, looking in, you can see in the chat we've we've amassed quite a number of questions already. Um, thankfully, started by Andrea, Andrea, and um, has added on. But uh, if if we start in in order, um, we'll we'll go we'll start with uh, Palash and uh, Emmanuel. Um, so first, actually, or maybe I could just invite Andrea to state the question instead of me reading it on your behalf. Andrea, if you don't mind. Okay, together for both speakers or just uh, focusing on Palash and Emmanuel? We'll, we'll do one at a time. 
Okay, that's, that. that's all right. So. So just to say, I, I really loved your paper and it's fantastic to see what is, you know, how, how you show very well how white privilege still works and, and maintains current power relations. Uh, two brief questions. One, whether I wonder if you thought about interviewing international development experts to see whether they are aware of their unjustified privilege and whether, you know, how they deal with this contradiction between a certain set of values across uh, development and the contradiction that actually their, their presence and their, and their privileged position, you know, uh, it's problematic for a number of reasons you highlighted very well. And the second question is whether a similar argument could be made uh, for development academics. Um, again, uh, those based in the global north being more funded and, and being very often taken more seriously than local academics on a number of issues. And so I've seen really a parallel. I could change uh, the word, uh, you know, national development experts or international development experts with academics and, uh, and the same things would happen. And I mean, the, and actually, you know, maybe the academics are a subset of these international development experts. So just, yeah, that, that's my question. Thank you, um, Emmanuel. Emmanuel very politely told me that you know he is in between and like you know having some connection issues. But Emmanuel, if you're hearing, please like you know, step in. So I would like to answer first, and um, if Emmanuel has to, you know, include you know wish to wishes to add anything, he will. So first question. Yes, we did think about it, but we did not have that resource. We are trying to build on this study. Um, we'll. We know, like, you know, I mean, this this research emanated from my original article in 2017 when I coined the term national development experts against the broad category of international development experts, which I have outlined. So this small scale study just like you know, generated from there. And um, we wanted to interview like, you know, international development experts, but in the article, I argued like, you know, that whatever we know about expert knowledge coming from white Western development experts is against the belief of aid ethnography. Ethnography needs to be holistic, right? That's the ethnographic approach in of methodology. If we persistently bombard with knowledge generated from one type of actor, and we say these are aid ethnographies, then my main question was like, no, this is partial knowledge. This is creating partial knowledge, right? So we wanted to argue and interview like international development experts, namely the white experts like in you know, Warnin um, and Bangladesh. It was impossible, but in future, I would very much like to do this. And um, I was not aware of that situation where you added footnote, Andrea, um, when you said like, you know, look, there are so many people working as illegal immigrants. So it is in the colonization of mind that people who have been colonized we have seen this by ourselves, like, you know, that they prefer white people. They prefer white experts, right? And I've got no clue why. I can only think of at this stage that this is the colonization of mind. Years and years, centuries of being colonized could be, could went through the politician's mind. And also, as you raised in your presentation too, it's a link between power. People who give you the money, it's more likely people listen to them. It goes to that, goes back to that famous phrase, who pays the piper calls the shot. Why people will listen to others when you know that like, this is one of you, he or she cannot make a decision or bring money for you. Yeah, development is much broader than like you know, this age-centric pers perspective. I'll be very precise. We can definitely talk. We are in touch and there, so I'd love to talk. The other one is that whether this could be relevant or related with the academics, of course, but it was not part of this study. It is obvious that you know all the time, for example, this is what I say like you know, every time I approach like you know, my respondents. Have you seen like you know, whenever there is an absolute chaos in your country? It could be Malawi, it could be Nigeria, it could be somewhere. It's not a Nigerian person, it's not a Ghanaian person who is talking in the BBC, CNN and all those things. It's always someone from LC, someone from Harvard, someone from Oxford, who have never been to that country, probably more than three months or six months. Years, right? So there are differences because they're in a privileged position connected with like you know, top level publishers sitting on the like, top academic journals 
and of course friends with like you know friends with like you know the top development expert top miss roy their friends they submit paper and it's hard to refuse but when other people are submitting from global south it gets disrejected thanks for highlighting this i'm sure this is worth investigating further i'll stop here now i can see like we have a similar question from albert happy to and emmanuel has raised his um, hand yes 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 emmanuel him, great. please yes and i think um i'll just add a few things to it because i think that um when you look at the work that we did um even as i speak right now just last two days ghana went for a we even went for a bailout from the imf and then you see that most of the people that have been brought in most of them are white right those based in the north and then just just um i would say that just this morning, the universities in this country, they issued a, they issued a press, they issued a press statement saying that they too have some form of, some expertise. So they don't see why almost every single time we find in terms of ourselves in some difficult um, times, we run to the IMF and then we don't involve in terms of the local guys. So from what um, our research looks at, most of the development um, issues that we are faced with, we often, neglect in terms of the local respects. And then at the end of the day, we, we seek for, in terms of the views of people from the North, which um, all these years we've been there for quite a long time. And you see that it has still not been able to help us in terms of how we deal with our de development issues. So, so to add up, I would say that the issue is also more to do with as he said, they have also, we shouldn't even forget that people based in the South also, they also have some form of an expertise, but we don't often use them because of the view that expertise from the North is much more superior than expertise from the South. No, that, that, thank you for the, those very powerful answers. And I'm, I'm wishing Eob was here from this morning talking about coloniality uh, in, in knowledge. Um, you know, in international relations, uh, race is making a comeback. Um, I'm wondering if race needs to make a comeback in addition to geography and international development as well. But, um, you know, that, that intervention aside, let's, let's move on to Andrea now. And we, we have um, two questions. If I, if I can ask both uh, Palash and um, I see also from this morning, uh, Rikio Kimura has joined us again. If I could ask um, both of you to just uh, raise your questions to Andrea in person. Um, Palash, would you care to go first? Or... Yeah, sure. Um... Yes. I could see that, you know, the question you talked about is about like, you know, um, what sort of intervention, I guess, right? Oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry. Um, just, just in the interest of time, moving on to Andrea's presentation. And so, Palash, I, I saw that you had written a question for Andrea in the comments. So if, if you'd like to just raise that now. Oh, sure. I was just like asking Andrea, like, what could happen 
in the participatory methodologies, right? You know, when the knowledge is from the people at the very bottom contradicts with the national level elites who are driven by the knowledge of the like, you know, globally powerful people um, and who provide money for the like, you know, to set the agenda of climate change and climate justice, right? So how, how we are going to reconcile these in the name of, of course, participatory methodologies and participatory development. So consensus building is never easy, right? Um, harmony, when like, you know, when there are plural voices, harmony is great. But when different voices are like you know, creating cacophony, then it is our task to find the right sort of policy to move forward. I was wondering, like, you know, what do you think? Yeah, and, I can. We'll, we'll also invite, um, if it's okay to just take both questions at once, Andrea, apologies. Uh, if we could also invite Rikio Kimura to, to raise this question. Okay, just uh, as, as I have written, how about intersectionality that people cannot articulate or people are unconscious of? Maybe some structural forces that people cannot really articulate or maybe they are, they are not conscious. Uh, how, who, who will articulate on their behalf? I and mean, if the researcher, you know, those structural forces, should the researcher articulate on their behalf? If that's the case, how does that influence power relationship between, between them? Thank you. Yeah, maybe on the, the first question, I want to, to tell a little bit of a, an example. And I, I had the privilege of being part of a massive uh, international uh, participatory research efforts to bring knowledge from the ground into the process of negotiating the sustainable development goals. And there, the first things that the UN did was to create this high level panel on uh, post 2015 that then became the SDGs. And so what, what, one of the things we did was to create ground level panels that could take the report of the high level panel and break it down to what it meant for them and provide some kind of criticism together with, uh, with a lot of quant qualitative stories and issues about those uh, living in poverty. And of course, this is not a knowledge that, pre that provide uh, fully fledged solution, uh, full policies, but it's a knowledge that can influence. And ultimately, you know, the sustainable development goals are not written by uh, by a researcher like ourselves or by the people living in poverty. But I believe this is a knowledge that can uh, add some new ideas, can shift some of the things. And one small example was that the sentence of one woman about leaving no one behind in her speech, in her way of representing the things, then became the main message of the of the agenda. So there are ways of influencing those agenda in a certain way. Of course, there are conflicts. And of course, you know, the, this knowledge doesn't have the power of other knowledges, but still is, is I think, is an important knowledge to provide. And especially in this case, where there is the intergovernmental panel on climate change, my idea is really to create the intersectional panel on climate change justice. That So the, the, the intergovernmental panel brings academic knowledge to government, basically, and, and policymakers. And we want to bring some grounded knowledge about the intersectional issues around climate to the scientists and to policymakers that then, uh, that then bring it up. So I think it's, it's on a different scale, it's a different type of knowledge, but I think it's one that gives a little bit of a complexity of certain issues. And this links well with the second question. So I. I don't think particularly that, uh, that there are people who cannot necessarily articulate uh, or are unconscious that someone else needs to work on their behalf. But certainly, for example, in the, in the work I propose, there are non-human animals, and those certainly cannot speak for themselves, and also future generations. And I think that in this case is where the role of uh, art form uh, play very nicely with something else that I, I found very useful, um, the concept of the veil of ignorance from uh, roles. So the idea that we we plan and think about uh, you know the principle for a for a just transition without knowing our role in society, but also without knowing when we are born. So if what if we you know let's create a a, a just society and think about the just society. Yeah, thinking that we might be born uh, you know, in, uh, in the Middle East in 50 years when temperature will be unbearable. And so these are thought exercises, of course, that have limited values also, you know, but I think through these, through arts forms, we can also uh, think and adapt the perspective of, uh, again, non-human animals, uh, nature itself and future generations.
Thank you so much, Andrea. Albert, are we going to? Uh, yes, we, let's we move on to. We still have a few minutes left. Uh, I think four minutes. So left. I, I think both both you and Andrea had questions to raise to to Nechita. Um yes. If you'd like to start. Sorry, Maybe we can sorry. invite Mai as well, because Mai Idris had a question and we haven't uh, allowed her to, to, to speak. Mai, oh, would yes, you like to yes. speak? Or Maybe we can read her question out. Mai, may we read your question out if you can't uh, mute, unmute? So Mai's question is um, the following the answers Hi. for Palash and Man. Um, what is the measure of the longevity of experts and their substantive contribution to projects? And what happens post-project and how can we measure that? And obviously I like measurement questions. So that's that's a really that's a really good one in terms of thinking through that. Um, so that that that's, that's I think is is a good question. So please do tell us about what happens post-project. Emmanuel, you'd like to go first? Maybe he's got an internet problem as well, Polosh. I don't know. Sure. I am happy to go. Um, I was just trying to make sure that in a way you work as a team. It, no, no, completely like understand. Serious, I just think maybe oh, we could just he's, he's reconnected through another device. Excellent. Emmanuel, please. Yeah. If you can hear us. I'm sorry about internet. I don't want to leave anyone out, but uh, please do let me know. If... Emmanuel, if you could just like, you know, say anything, or if you want me to go, I'm happy to do it, but I thought it would be more collegially for me if you start this one. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, for the sake of for the sake of the panel, I mean, I think I should go. But Emmanuel, please join in, like you know, whenever you're ready. So it's a very, very, very good question, and um, we did not think about it in our research um, so far because we were trying to understand the motivations and agency. But how do we measure expertise is a seriously like a difficult question. Um, so what we found is like people who have like an extensive work experience rather than people who have got like a significant funding authority. So for us, authority was, expertise was based on the knowledge on the local context. So what we did, like you know, we interviewed or we approached people who had at least five to 10 years of working experience in Ghana. So not only who was a Ghanaian, but also had like you know, at least five, 10 years of experience for most cases, 10 or even above, but five was like our lowest years of experience. But again, to emphasize, years does not make somebody experts. It's about the deeper knowledge and understanding of the local reality. And this is what we found in our response from our respondents, that sometimes somebody could just come and fly. Someone just like you know, coming and they do not know the context better. For example, if it is a language program, how someone coming from a different country who speaks a different language will have better authority to tell how like the local language should be instigated and implemented in a Ghanaian context. But this was not the case in the majority of the cases. And post, post measurement about the impact, and that's exactly what we have been puzzled about. It seems like development is like you know, something of like, you know, um, in a new patrimonial system, that's what we talk about like in our paper about Ghanaian system, where policy expertise is not everything because politicians control everything. Because politicians need to be, get elected from the, from the electorate. So they want to claim the development success. It's not the policy experts who claim the success, right? So policy experts you know, play the second fiddle. For the international development experts, this is none of their business. Their business is about operationalizing the project and maintaining the fund and spending it right as soon as the project is over development is over but for the local national development experts it is their passion that they want to contribute to the national development they want to make people's lives to positively change and they want to do something for their own country and that's where like we are now looking at the agency so for the national development experts agency is driven by something more subjective 
But for an international development experts or white consultants or someone works for the donor, for them, it's about project management. So it's the new managerial, new liberal idea of development. So we have on the one hand, a group of people who is driven by passion and interest for their own country. And on the other hand, people who want to maintain that the objectives, goals, as stated in the lock frame or other terms of conditions are met. So we have development management and we have doing development, right? And that, that, like, that fascinates to the, this idea of knowledge, level of expertise and measure of expertise and probably the outcome of development interventions. Mari, we are happy to like, not talk to you afterwards, but in the short space of time, we hope we have answered your question for now. Thank you. Emmanuel has said it's fine for you to answer that he's having internet problems. So I, uh, next that if we can move to you next, and there are questions for you. Weber, is there a question to next that or is it a comment? Okay, so there are just some questions for next that. Uh, uh, and that that is about you know your point about the words and how powerful the words are like the idea of the buzzword should we move away from words is that the way that we can uh, subvert the power relations and actually execute the, the knowledge hierarchies please over to you no definitely that's an excellent question and i would suggest that yes we might perhaps find it productive to move away from the word itself to look at the process by which that word or that concept has been endorsed. And also maybe start to realize that the process may not have been as smooth as we're usually told by, you know, UN's public information. So I do recognize, and of course I realize that I need to do a lot more work on this aspect of my research, but I think I do recognize that the process of coming to prominence of resilience was not as harmonized as we may be led to sometimes believe. So I do, for instance, notice that the UNDP may not have been that happy with actually having to define their work in terms of a resilience lens uh, from now on, uh, rather than calling for development in a technocratic manner, but still calling for development uh, as they are, you know, want to do. Uh, so in that respect, uh, what I would like to do is, I think, take these concepts as Andrea has also perhaps suggested in his question to me as objects that may both help but also keep uh, knowledge producers and other development actors uh, from coming together. And is there space, therefore, I wish to ask in that process, in that process of rising to prominence uh, for development studies researchers as well as perhaps you know, alternative development thinkers uh, to be able to intervene, to be able to make use of these perhaps internal conflicts between these high level agencies uh, to, to interrupt the process and provide inputs from the ground as Andrea has, has also mentioned. Uh, is, is there space both for scholarship and for, for practitioners uh, to try to try to have these inputs taken into consideration in that process. Now, on the one hand, I feel that the way in which this particular concept has, has risen to prominence in response to protracted conflict and the decline in humanitarian funding, it makes me perhaps lead to saying that that avenue may have actually been closed for us. But on the other hand, uh, when I actually look at how much a lot of these organizations and a lot of the people who are working for these organizations have actually been able to raise a certain kind of criticism uh, against having to incorporate the concept of resilience in their work. Uh, I still feel that certain margin might still exist in that process. Thank so in, in general you, terms, yeah. And I think Thank it you. kind of feeds into Albert's larger question of whether it's valuable. Albert, do you want to rephrase what you're saying there uh, in terms of uh, like to answer your question yourself, ask a question yourself? Well, that's that your, your presentation is very welcome because Rekha and I were also talking this morning about this, this sudden rise, this boom in resilience. And this was mentioned in the plenary this morning as well, that, you know, whether you like it or not, it's one of these new buzzwords. Um, but, you know, the case of Syria is, is also very interesting in, in, in examining just the dynamics, the mechanics of how this actually occurs. And, and this 
this is interesting across all these panels, you know, what are the specific mechanics in which these ideas, these knowledge, these experts circulate? And if we understand how this mechanism works, then perhaps can we can we stage some interventions? I, I don't know if you've seen this yourself, Najla, in the humanitarian space, but you know, is is there is there a way that we can, for lack of a better term, if you'll forgive the statement, sort of hijack the system to to, to change it, hopefully for uh, I don't want to say for the better, but for a more inclusive, uh, sustainable approach. Definitely, I mean, I think that's an excellent point. And again, to try to also connect to what Andrea has has explained to us and and you know mentioned, is there space here for, for instance for say people who might be interested in using aesthetics or aesthetic pathways uh, for lack of a better term to actually try to understand or to perhaps even showcase that there are different understandings of resilience that may not always overlap uh, with the way in which this concept uh, has been understood in international development and humanitarian assistance. Now, as someone who actually does communications within this space, who works in the field of communications within this space, I find myself usually thinking, okay, I mean, what we do is actually we take, say, a testimonial from the ground level, and we actually transform it, spin it, so to speak, in a way that will serve the purposes of this higher level thinking on resilience. But is there space there for people who might be more skilled in being able to understand those testimonials to actually pinpoint a much different understanding of resilience and use that as the basis of a pedagogy uh, not only for each other and not only within development studies, uh, but also generally in development and humanitarian uh, practice. Uh, now, I would like to feel that, yes, that pedagogy is, is very much possible, but there will need to be people who are perhaps much more, uh, how to put it, uh, practically uh, minded uh, than, than, you know, us researchers who would also be able to uh, formulate these interventions, uh, not so much as, as you know, as studies in development, uh, but uh, rather uh, as, as Andre had put it, uh, as, this, as this ability to, to raise these discourses from the ground up. Uh, now that I think points out to the presence of two different mechanisms here. Now, being able to recognize the presence of this pedagogy, but also having to take into account that there needs to be a different kind of mechanism that will that we might support, but you know are not perhaps in a position to implement ourselves. Uh, that will have that pedagogy, for lack of a better word, uh, disseminated. Thank you so much, Nech. That um, I'm going to I'm moving towards the last few minutes, but I wanted to both allow Weber to ask his really valuable question and comment. But but also, Andrea, I think it links to what Weber's been say, wants to say, and that is your your point about storytelling for me is very much a kind of Hegelian turning on its head. You're allowing the actors then to tell the story, and and for the others to to be the audience, which is a fascinating way of of talking about change. So maybe you'd like to say a few words at the end, but Weba, maybe you'd like to make your very valuable point about more progressive ingos. Yeah, so I was just uh, reacting to what uh, Palash said. And um, I think it also relates to some of the discussions this morning that we, and, and obviously it's difficult, particularly when we try and think about how we can give voice or how, how we can stimulate uh, true voice in, uh, in the global south to be heard, etc. But sometimes we tend to also present, let's say, development as one hegemonic monster almost. Uh, and I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, in, in South Africa in, in the late 90s, I witnessed a Dutch um, international NGO that uh, made a conscious decision to provide so-called core funding to its local partners so that they, they themselves could decide which political activities, which campaigns they would invest uh, the money in. 
So, you know, there, there are those exceptions to uh, uh, basically the, the, the picture that you are sketching, Palash, I, I agree with. Um, but I, I think we also have to be careful that, yeah, there, there, are, there are better practices out there. Thank you. Andrea, final words to you. Such a brilliant presentation, so rich, but please come back to us of your thoughts. No, just, just the, 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 the great things about storytelling. And here, I mean, all this thinking comes from having collaborated and want to collaborate with a colleague called Joanna Wheeler, who has worked a lot on transformative story and the idea of, in this case, did, did, especially with complex processes, intersectionality, how stories can bring all those elements together in a way, in a sort of synthetic way that can also allow other people to empathize with you and understanding that complexity of things, which sometimes I found very difficult, especially talking about climate change with the more, you know, science based and tech based uh, colleagues. So sometimes the story for me are very powerful to show, you know, the, 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 how certain adaptation intervention leads to displacement, how they affect livelihoods in different ways. And all those complexity about the positive, the negative, sometimes it's not about a, a mathematic uh, formula, but it's really about starting to comprehend all these different forms and also then they can be used both to to dialogue with other peers and then try to identify common principal struggles but are also powerful in themselves to um to be presented to to other actors in a more un, uh, in a less mediated way by the researcher which i think can be can be quite powerful. So I, I think, and this also can be also a healing process, a process of self-understanding. So I think, especially in you know in this particular sphere, I'm not saying it's it's the only method or is the best or is the best methods, but I think in 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 this limited space where I think intersectional participatory methods can give a contribution, I think storytelling has a, an important role to say to play and of course there are different me methods to do storytelling etc cetera, etc cetera, and uh, with diversities but i'm not gonna go in any of those details and i think that's a very valuable point that you're making about the more difficult or seemingly technical is the point that reka made in the first session i think uh elil and i made in the second session the whole narrative is about why te technical seems to be so alien and how it is our responsibility to 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 work it in a language and to learn what the community actually sees of these phenomena rather than to, to impose. I think you've provided us a really powerful toolkit to do that, Andrea. Palash, you have your hand up, so please. And if people have to go to other sessions, fine, but we can take a few minutes because there's so many exciting questions. So please. Sure. Thank you, Shailaja, for the opportunity. Um, my apologies if I did not get your first name. Dr. Nauta, I guess. Uh... Weber. Weber. See you smiling. Weber, Weber yeah. Um, that is a super question, and um, I'd like to, because I, I raised my hand, because I wanted to make it publicly known that in our paper, we consistently say that the NDs are by any means not a homogeneous category. There will be different groups, there will be competition amongst themselves, and we have demonstrated that in, in our paper clearly, like, you know, how they compete against each other and how I can create groups. Similarly, in the same vein, like, you know, that not I, all INGOs are like doing the right sort of thing and they play by the rules all the time. They are also engaged in some activities which are not within the limit of development. Let's put it in this way, like you said, like, you know, to engage into like you know, local national level politics. So in short, we're aware of these to some extent. And um, Emmanuel has asked me to say this, that if you have any suggestions, all of you, we are still in a line research project. We are trying to work further. We are trying to expand this. We are looking for collaboration too. By all means, if you want, you can have a look up for our works um, available online in most of the in, in, in development policy review and in third, third world quarter lease. Would be very much receptive of your ideas, feedback, questions, and opportunities for collaboration. Would like to interview and feature the, some of the white, white international development experts. And from different range, like you know, some seniors, some like, you know, and from gender perspective, would like to understand some theoretical understanding, not from aid ethnography, but from power, technical elements of like you know, development, controlling development, right? Dictating development. 
would like to also look into some of the aspects that talks about aid relationships, you know, the use of IBINs and others, right? So we are very much open to suggestions, feedback, and questions for collaboration. So Emmanuel, I hope that you know, I have done the justice, but we were, thanks very much. We are not generalizing anything here, not at all. It's absolutely fantastic. There's, so I can't type and do talk at the same time. I can't do that. I can't multitask. Uh, but this has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Andrea, thank you for the, the powerful presentation. Weba for staying on uh, for everybody. It's been such a such a really exciting journey. I reiterate those of you who have become resilience interest uh, higher, Reka and Albert have a conference. They'll circulate that. We'll keep the web, uh, the, the group going. We'll create a chat, but also maybe once it's over, and we can talk about how DSA might take uh, some of these discussions forward to the next conference, but this has been absolutely brilliant. I've learned so much. Please enjoy the rest of your time as a DSA council member, I should say that, but this is the best bit, being in, in the sessions. And so I hope to see you around for the rest of the conference and we will keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. It was a lovely panel. And thank you, Anastasia. You've been amazing. Can I stop the recording, you, right? Yes, of course. Thank yeah. you so much. Bye-bye. Everyone you. enjoy your cup of tea. Bye-bye. Bye then. Bye.